Your deck rots out in ten years. Their wooden beams survived eight hundred. That is not a myth. Across Europe and parts of Asia, there are medieval churches, barns, bridges, and bits of furniture made from nothing more than ordinary wood, no pressure treatment, no synthetic sealers, that are still doing their job centuries after the people who built them turned to dust. Modern science has studied those timbers, measured their fibers, tested their chemistry, and still largely treats them as curiosities, not as a living instruction manual for how to build wood that actually lasts. The method that kept them alive is simple, natural, and scalable. It just does not fit easily into a world built around fast lumber and disposable construction. The medieval method starts long before any brush, oil, or tar ever touches the surface. It begins in the forest, with choices that look like superstition, but line up eerily well with what modern wood science says about rot. Medieval carpenters did not cut trees whenever they felt like it. They watched the seasons. Trees were felled in the cold months, often in late winter, when the sap was lowest. To them, this was the proper time. To a modern analyst, it is the point when the tree's moisture and sugar content are at their minimum. Less sugar means less food for fungi. Less internal water means less movement, fewer cracks, and fewer entry points for decay. They matched species to job, favoring dense, slow-grown oak, cypress, larch, and other naturally durable woods for the pieces that had to survive the longest. Builders learned, through painful experience, that pale, fast-grown sapwood dies young. Dark, resin-rich heartwood gets old with dignity. Even more counterintuitive, some of the most durable medieval wood was soaked on purpose. Shipwrights, bridge builders, and certain carpenters knew that throwing fresh logs straight into a dry shed was a recipe for warping, splitting, and unpredictable failure. Instead, they chained logs together and sank them in rivers, ponds, or special pits. The wood sat there, underwater, for months or years. At first glance, that looks like a mistake. Everyone knows wet wood rots. But underwater, without oxygen, the kinds of fungi that normally chew through timber cannot do their work efficiently. At the same time, water slowly pulls out sugars, tannins, and mobile compounds from the wood. The log becomes denser and more chemically boring to decay organisms. When it is finally hauled up and allowed to dry, slowly, under cover, with air moving around every face, the result is timber that moves less, shrinks more evenly, and offers fungi far less nutrition. Patience was the second layer of preservation. There was no rush to build with green wood when building for the long term. Boards and beams were stacked off the ground, with thin spacers between them, under roofs that let wind pass but kept rain away. A one-inch board might rest for a year. Thick, beams could season for several. Over time, the internal stresses that make wood twist and cup eased out gradually. Any early fungal attack was slowed by falling moisture levels and regular airflow. The outer surfaces hardened and acclimated before load-bearing began. In an age without moisture meters, peasants used weight, sound, and feel. A seasoned beam rang differently under a mallet than a green one. An experienced hand could lift two pieces and tell you which was ready. If this was all they had done, winter felling, water leaching, slow seasoning, their wood would still have lasted longer than most modern boards. But the true medieval preservation method really shows itself in what came next, a way of saturating the wood with natural substances that turned its own structure into a long-lived, layered defense. At the heart of that method is something sticky, dark, and strongly scented, pine tar. Long before anyone wrote down a chemical formula, 
Vikings, shipwrights, and builders knew that wood coated with distilled pine resin behaved differently. Pine tar is made by heating pine stumps, roots, and resinous wood in low oxygen, driving off a thick, amber to black liquid rich in complex resins and phenolic compounds. To the human nose, it smells smoky, sharp, a little medicinal. To fungi and many insects, it is poison. When warmed and brushed onto timber, pine tar does not just sit politely on top. It seeps into pores and cell walls. Over days and weeks, it reacts with oxygen and thickens, almost becoming part of the wood itself. Instead of being a thin coat waiting to crack, it becomes a flexible, tough, water-shedding internal armor. Archaeology and historical records show how important tar was. In parts of Scandinavia, tar production was a major industry. Specialized kilns were built to produce dozens of gallons at a time. A single longship could drink more than a hundred gallons to saturate its planks and seams fully. They coated everything, hulls, masts, ropes, and exposed structural timbers. That tar kept water out, yes, but it also kept life out. Fungi that cause rot struggle in an environment soaked with phenols and resins. Marine borers and insects have a harder time getting started. Tar darkened the wood, shielding it from ultraviolet light that breaks down lignin and causes graying and brittleness. In a kind of pre-modern material science, medieval builders had found a way to give wood a second, tougher skin from the inside. But pine tar alone had weaknesses. It is thick. Cold, it can sit on the surface without penetrating deeply. It also weathers off slowly under sun and rain. This is where the ignored part of the medieval method comes in, the way they combined tar with other natural materials to create a complete system. The first partner in that system is boiled linseed oil. Pressed from flax seeds, linseed oil is a classic drying oil. It soaks into wood fibers and, when exposed to air, polymerizes. In plain, language, it seeps in as a liquid and gradually turns into a solid network intertwined with the wood. Medieval and early modern craftsmen discovered that if you warm tar and mix it with boiled linseed oil, the oil carries the tar deeper. The mixture becomes thinner when heated, flows into the grain instead of sitting on top, and then hardens in place. The tar brings its resins and fungicides. The oil brings penetration and internal hardening. Together, they turn the outer zone of the timber into a kind of composite, where natural polymers and resins fill voids, block wicking paths for water, and make it very difficult for decay organisms to find a foothold. The second partner is beeswax. Beeswax is soft, hydrophobic, and stable. On its own, it is not a deep preservative, but as a top layer over oil and tar, it shines. Craftsmen heated it and blended it with oils or resins to make pastes that could be rubbed into timber. The wax filled tiny surface cracks, smoothed the outer texture, and offered a renewable sacrificial layer that could be refreshed when worn. Water beaded on waxed surfaces. Dirt and spores had a harder time sticking. Underneath, the tar and oil saturated zone continued doing the heavy preservation work. Wax turned the system into something maintainable. You did not have to strip and redo everything. You just refreshed the skin as needed. This three-part method, tar for biocidal, water-shedding depth, oil for penetration and internal hardening, wax for surface sealing and renewability, is what many modern viewers instinctively think of as that old dark wood look. It is visible in certain medieval repairs where scientists have scraped and analyzed residues, tar, resin, wax, and fillers still present after centuries of weather. It is in the dark, glossy surfaces of ancient beams that have clearly been nourished, not just painted. 
It is in the survival of outdoor timbers that faced storm after storm, yet remain sound where more recent, modern repairs have already failed. And fire still played a role. In multiple cultures, including medieval Europe and Japan, craftsmen discovered that carefully charring the surface of wood was not destruction, but transformation. A controlled pass with flame burns away soft, sugar-rich outer fibers and leaves behind a thin layer of carbon. This carbonized shell is unattractive to insects and fungi, absorbs and releases water more slowly than raw wood, and resists ultraviolet damage better. It also forms a rough, porous skin that is ideal for holding tar and oil. A charred and tarred post in the ground can last far longer than one simply cut and buried. The fire sterilizes the surface, the char layer slows water movement, the tar and oil fill what remains. For medieval builders dealing with fence posts, piles, and lower cladding in wet climates, this was not an artistic flourish. It was a survival tactic for their structures. If you strip away the romance, the medieval method looks like a neat stack of physical and chemical advantages. Start with wood that is naturally more durable and less nutritious to rot organisms. Remove extra sugars and equalize moisture slowly so the wood is dimensionally stable. Impregnate the outer zone with a deep, flexible, biocidal resin carried by a drying oil. Seal the surface with a waxy layer that sheds water but does not trap internal moisture. Where needed, prechar the surface to create a carbon buffer and better key for the mixture. Design the structure so water drains away, end grain is protected, and sun exposure is moderated. Every step seems small. Together, they produce timber that can shrug off centuries. Modern science has not truly ignored these methods in the sense of never looking at them. Researchers have analyzed archaeological wood, measured its mineral content, its residual lignin, its microstructure. Conservators debate the best ways to stabilize waterlogged beams pulled from old wells or shipwrecks, but the specific medieval practice of saturating building timber with natural tar oil wax blends and using fire as a preparatory tool has never become a mainstream industrial standard. It is too slow. It is too dependent on careful craftsmanship. It does not fit into high-speed production lines churning out uniform planks designed to last just long enough to keep customers coming back. Instead, we invented pressure-treated lumber, soft, fast-grown pine and spruce infused under pressure with copper-based compounds, fungicides, and other chemical preservatives. These timbers do resist certain forms of decay and insect attack, at least for a while, but they also bring toxicity concerns, disposal issues, and a familiar pattern, coatings that crack, joins that trap water, and boards that still twist, cup, and fail because the underlying wood was never allowed to be stable in the first place. The preservation system is tacked on from outside, after the fact, rather than grown into the material over time. There is also an odd cultural bias at work. Many modern engineers and chemists assume that anything worth knowing about materials must have been discovered in a lab with instruments, not through generations of observation on farms and in shipyards. When they do look back, they often extract one ingredient, say linseed oil or carbonized surfaces, and study it in isolation. The medieval method is inconveniently holistic. Tar by itself is messy and dark. Oil alone can mildew or chalk if misused. Wax alone is too soft and thin. Fire alone, uncontrolled, is just burning. The brilliance is in the way they are combined and applied to already well-chosen, well-seasoned wood. That old method also forces a different relationship with time. You cannot do it in an afternoon. To build a structure meant to last a century, a medieval builder began prepping material years in advance, 
selecting trees, seasoning them, sometimes soaking them. The Tades of finishing treatments themselves took days to apply and cure properly, heating tar, thinning it with oil, working it into warm timbers, letting it set, then waxing and buffing. This is not compatible with build now, sell now economics. It is compatible with a worldview in which your grandson will still sleep under the roof you raise, and your name may be forgotten, but your beams will hold. If you are a curious, practical, slightly nostalgic viewer, the interesting question is not, why don't big companies do this? It is, which parts of this can I steal for my own projects? You probably cannot haul oak logs into a lake for three years, but you can be choosy about species and sourcing, favoring heartwood from naturally durable species. You may not have a tar kiln, but real pine tar and boiled linseed oil are available from traditional suppliers. You can warm them gently, blend them in sensible proportions, and brush or rub them into wood that has been allowed to dry thoroughly. You can follow with a beeswax-based top coat, renewed every few years. For posts and lower cladding, you can experiment with careful surface charring before treatment, watching how it changes water beading and weathering. You can also design as they did. Lift wood off the ground on stone or concrete, protect end grain with caps or overhangs, and give water a clear escape route from every joint. The forgotten method is not a magic paste that forgives bad design. It is a powerful multiplier for good design, turning a thoughtful structure into something that feels strangely immune to time. Modern science did not so much ignore this method as fail to translate it into the language of industry. To a laboratory, pine tar is a complex mixture of organic compounds with variable composition. To a peasant or shipwright, it was simply what worked, proven on ships that crossed oceans and on roofs that saw dozens of winters. To a chemist, beeswax is a mixture of esters and long-chain molecules. To a medieval finisher, it was the final polish that made rain slide and hands glide. To an engineer, fire is a risk. To a careful craftsman, it was a tool that unlocked new properties in old materials. Yet if you bring that modern understanding back to the old process, it becomes clear that the medievals were not stumbling in the dark. Through trial and error, they built a treatment system that exploits exactly the same principles our textbooks describe, removing nutrients from the substrate, reducing moisture cycling, blocking diffusion pathways, poisoning decay organisms, and shielding against UV radiation. They did it with pine stumps, flax seeds, bees, and fire. In the end, the medieval wood-preserving method modern science ignored is less about a secret recipe and more about a lost attitude, an insistence that materials and methods should serve centuries, not quarters, that you start preserving wood before you cut the tree, that you see heat, time, and natural. Chemistry as allies, not obstacles. If you pick up a brush loaded with warm tar and oil and push it into a board you intend to put outside, you are not just finishing wood. You are reconnecting with a line of anonymous builders, shipwrights, and carpenters who learned the hard way. How to make organic material defy the normal clock of decay. Their cathedrals, barns, and boats are their footnotes. The wood itself is the proof. And if you step back from a beam, you have treated that way and imagine someone running a hand along it a hundred years from now, wondering why it never seemed to rot like the others. You will have understood the heart of their method, whether or not anyone ever puts it in a scientific journal.